Hi, Bana. Welcome to Only 5 Minutes. Thanks, Emiliano. It's nice to see you. Bana, vehicle integrated PV is still a niche. Last year, however, we've seen some interesting industrial developments. Do you believe this market is moving towards a new dimension? Well, as you said, it's still niche. And really, in the grand scheme of things, it's going to remain fortunate because the solar industry has grown so big. Um, you know, it's, it's going to remain potentially something that could be considered niche, but niche could be on the order of 30 or 40 gigawatts a year um, in, in the fairly near future. So potentially by the end of the decade. Um, so what we've seen happening at the in this year is that um, a number of companies, as you've said, have, have really made big efforts and even started production. Um, the uh, that, that, of course, leads to a lot of promise in terms of actually vehicles having having this technology on the road in the next year or two. We'll see those as test cases. Um, but, yeah, there's still quite a few challenges that lie ahead. We have production, but not on high volume. Um, and we and, and these companies have a lot of work to do to to, you know, get these products out on the road. Now, there is a there's kind of a couple different directions the industry is going there. Are, of course, the really the things that are capturing the headlines, which are things like Lightyear and Sono Motors um, and, and getting these these actual solar electric vehicles on the road. Um, but there are also is a lot of activity going on for putting solar on other types of vehicles, small vehicles, for example, uh, lightweight vehicles um, and kind of urban mobility. So there's actually quite a few companies that are also launching products and starting production of those. And then we also see a, a lot more happening on the side of um, trucks and heavy duty transport and buses. You said there are a few challenges to overcome. Which are the biggest ones? I think at this point, the community has settled fairly well on using crystalline silicon for this first generation of PV. Um, and they're able to do this mostly on equipment and manufacturing the, the tools that are available today. But as we get to the next, this is all of course for, for kind of relatively small scale and small series, uh, small number series of vehicles or, or prototypes almost. Um, so let's say less than a thousand. To really get this off the ground and having a big impact, we have to scale to more to higher volumes, to more numbers in the hot larger series that are coming off the manufacturing lines. And to be honest, this is one of the biggest issues that I think both the community will face in the next year or year and a half is ramping up that that production and actually solving some of the complexities of of manufacturing um, that's necessary for for bringing these products on the line. Um, this is actually something that we have studied at TNO and actually done a survey of a number of experts in the field. And this is by before, beyond every other topic. This is the thing that we see is that this manufacturing is the next step for and the next big challenge for this community. Well, you say 30 gigawatt by the end of this decade. For this, we need big scale in the industry. I mean, there what we're talking about is being able to address a fairly large segment of the electric vehicle market by the end of the decade globally. Um, we might see that that being there's kind of two ways to get to 30 gigawatts. Um, if you imagine, there could be each company having their own manufacturing lines, but then there also could be the concept of say a a um, an automotive supplier that would be providing these sort of components, or maybe multiple suppliers that would be providing these components to larger OEMs that they would then be able to actually uh, put things together and manufacture in house. Which solar cell technology should prevail in this segment? Interesting question because there, as I said, I think crystal and silicon is where most companies, most most suppliers or providers of PV uh, integrated PV technologies are are directed right now, and the re reasons for this are twofold. One is supply chain. There's a very well established supply chain, and of course, when you're a niche market, you don't want to bet your horse on something that has a lot of risk. And secondly. The other bit is cost. So thin films are actually probably a very good potential concept, especially three fives. Um, I know that Toyota um, and Nissan have been talking a lot about high efficiencies and, and that sort of technology and how beneficial it is. But cost is still prohibitive. Um, and there are, of course, roadmaps to getting down to lower costs. But that cost, until it is coming down, is still prohibitive for looking at a much larger, uh, larger deployment of vehicle integrated PB. If we look towards the future, of course, perovskites could be very promising, as well as tandems. But 
as you know, those are not quite on the manufacturing lines yet. Should we expect big news for 2023? I think, I mean, Lightyear has recently announced that they are, um, you know, bringing their first solar electric vehicles off the line um, and, and shipping those out. Um, Sono Motors has also recently announced that they are rethinking their strategy a bit and potentially going towards more of a solar focus rather than overall vehicle focus. Um, and then we have, as I mentioned, there's a lot of action going on in the heavy commercial vehicles market. Um, there's a number of different providers that can make these lighter weight modules that are needed, that are quite robust, that can be used for putting on trucks and buses. Um, and I think we'll see a lot of growth in that direction. Of course, it probably won't grab the headlines in quite the same way that, that new fancy cars do. But the, the impact of those sort of applications is actually enormous when it comes to looking at the energy transition and, and saving our planet. Thanks for your five minutes, Bana. Thank you. Thank you.